Nita, as you know, is coming to us from Melbourne. It's 11.05 her time in the morning tomorrow. And she, um, she is very familiar with the NGV of Melbourne. And we're very, very lucky to have her because she, she has some wonderful revelations to share with us. So if everyone can mute at this time, and we will give it away to Nita. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, Courtney, and thank you, everybody, for being here and uh, showing some trust to listen to me, uh, even though I'm upside down on the southern end of the planet. We're talking tonight about Charles Dickens' art and the National Gallery of Victoria. This photo that you see here is the external main entrance of our gallery. It was designed by Mario Bellini and it has a mausoleum kind of uh, look about it, but it is a very beautiful um, gallery. And so the question you will be asking is, what does Charles Dickens have to do with any art in this modern gallery? We're going to walk through the 19th century uh, gallery section of the National Gallery of Victoria. And we will look at art that's inspired by Dickens, art that's found in Dickens, and we will meet artists who are connected to Dickens, either happily, unhappily, or with some indifference. In the 19th century, art and literature both fed off each other. Artists were the equivalent of film stars and writers, especially Charles Dickens, were also well known. Dickens was so highly regarded that Queen Victoria had to pass legislation to ban the throwing of hub bugs in public. Works of art were exhibited at the Salon in France and at the Royal Academy in England. They were the entertainment of the time. Entry, entry was free and the artists were well known to the general public. The focus of 19th century art shifted from classical and heroic pictures to the ordinary, the romantic, the sentimental, and the humorous. Does that sort of style remind you of any writer you know? Flaubert called 19th century art the vaudeville of art. Thackeray complained, art has been deposed in favor of a gentle sentiment, an agreeable, quiet incident, a tea table tragedy, or a bread and butter idol. So, I hope you like humbugs. We're going to have a little quiz along the way. I'd like you to write down your answers. We offer humbugs as reward for ingenuity, gumption, exceptional knowledge, um, keep track of your answers and you'll get them at the end. So where do we really begin? Here you go. Well, Queen Victoria. We commissioned this portrait by Sir Hubert von Herkimer. He was Queen Victoria's favorite artist. Queen Victoria did not like sitting for portraits. Herkimer had to paint her portrait from a sculpture and it looks like it. And then through negotiations with her daughter, he was allowed to take tea with the queen and observe her without being obvious about it and without staring. But she did insist to see it the day after it, it was completed. Now, Herkimer was an amazing man. He was an actor, composer, playwright, early filmmaker, and a remarkable educationalist. He believed that everyone should be able to paint, play an instrument, and act. Van Gogh called Herkimer an inspiration. After painting this portrait, Herkimer got a job in Melbourne 
buying art for the National Gallery of Victoria, but lost the job with the Great Depression of 1893, and he had to return to England. But we had money before that depression. We had gold and we had money, and we spent it on buying a lot of European art, particularly British art, Queen Victoria's art. Herkimer's beginnings were very poor. He was born in Germany. And when he came to England, he added the von to his name to give himself some prestige. He painted society portraits and he donated much of his money to give young people access to the arts. He encouraged artists to eschew convention and to pursue their own instincts and individuality. He was one of the key Victorian social realists. They were a group of artists, along with Frank Hall, whom we'll see later, whose work was considered gritty. You see an example on the left. He published for many years in the magazine called The Graphic, William Thomas, its first editor, had an astute business sense. If Dickens was hugely popular, then his magazine would produce the same effect in art. It dealt with social concerns, Dickens' social concerns for the poor, fallen women, orphans, poverty. One difference between the social realists and other earlier artists who also painted Dickens themes is that they didn't spin off the literature. They were the cameramen, if you like, on the spot, painting it from real life. So this is an image of migrant workers, refugees looking for work, destitute on the roads. Um, not an un unfamiliar sight today. Uh, and this, this was also, um, a clear reference to Dickens, entitling it Hard Times. We don't have this one in our gallery, but we do have many, many works um, from Queen Victoria's times. And this one is the most famous one of von Herkimer. It was painted long after his death, but still, um, very relevant to people, interested in die with Dickens. All right, William Etty. William Etty was an English artist, son of York. He was famous for his nudes. Uh, Victorians painted a lot of nudes, but they dressed them. They dressed them in allegory, mythology, religion history, literature, antiquity. Dormier produced a cartoon of two women visiting an exhibition at the French Salon. They peer with disgust at a work and it's a nude and they claim, oh, not another Venus. Well, that's how the nude passed muster. But Etty's nudes were sometimes too fleshy or provo provocative and they were censored. Nonetheless, he became a hero of York, and there is a life-size statue of Etty outside the York Art Gallery. Now, this is a study for the Deluge, which is a much larger work, representing, believe it or not, Noah's flood. You see a beautiful, nude, limp woman. Um, she looks washed out spent as though she enjoyed her deluge very much. Victorians explained female desire in medical terms, and one third of insane asylums were populated by diagnosed nymphomaniacs. What's this got to do with Dickens? While Etty and Dickens were not friends, they had friends in common, for example, the actor William McCready, and they often met at dinners. Etty's politics were far too different from Dickens. He believed that if you were poor, it was your own fault. Nonetheless, Dickens refers to Etty in his work. Now, for a humbug, 
where does Dickens write? It is high time, it is really high time that Mr. Etty was prosecuted and made public example of. So make a note of that one if you've got the answer or a question mark if you don't, or have a think about it along the way. Let's move on. Ostada. The artist Sir David Wilkie and Charles Dickens were very good friends. And Wilkie had a profound influence on Dickens's taste in art. Wilkie was Scottish, a passionate about 17th century Dutch art. He painted genre, um, emotion rather than history. His work was often crowded, strong lights and darks, uh, painting the common person rather than elite filled with human emotion. Wilkie said of Dickens as Nicol Nicholas Nickleby that there has been nothing like it since Samuel Richardson. We don't have a David Wilkie in our collection, but his influence on Dickens was immeasurable. According to Dickens' daughter, Kate Perugini, David Wilkie was the first artist whom her father knew intimately. Wilkie visited galleries with Dickens and taught Dickens a lot about art. He, as he loved 17th century Dutch art, especially the art of Adrian van Ostade, he strongly influenced Dickens' understanding and appreciation of Ostade. You can see we have 29 etchings by the Netherland artist Ostade, this one on your left, Saying Grace, is just one of them. In this work, you can see a crowded, dramatically lit interior with a husband and wife, small children, all huddled together in a room with a small table supposed to hold their dinner and not enough chairs to go round. Nonetheless, they bow their heads to say grace and give thanks for what they have received. The room beyond and above them is in darkness and the light focuses on the praying figures. I find the position of the ladder behind them fascinating and wonder that while it depicts an obvious uh, physical dwelling leading from light below to darkness above, might it be saying something about the true spirituality of these peasants? Saying grace is a scene of sentiment, reverence for the poor, the humble, the everyday. It could have been written by Dickens. Beside it, I include the fight scene um, to the right, which is not in our collection, but it shows very clearly Ostada's typical use of dramatic lighting, often with just a single flickering candle or light source. The dramatic lighting adds to the intensity of the emotion. It is very Dickensian. Dark, crowded scenes, often lit by fire, were Ostada's um, mainstay. Now, both Dickens and Wilkie in their respective arts sought to express human emotion and in a popular and accessible style, both focused on the common and everyday rather than historical figures and scenes. In a speech given by after Wilkie's death in 1840, Dickens presents him as a painter who had abandoned the reverence for the antique for scenes of his own day, just like Dickens. And Dickens said, I think of him as one who made the cottage hearth his grave theme and who surrounded the lives and cares and daily toils and occupations of the poor with dignity and beauty. That's the speech he gave uh, in, at Wilkie's death in 1841. Now for a humbug, where in Dickens' work does Dickens mention the Dutch artist Ostada? He was brave to do so, but not as brave as we think because people knew artists. The, the galleries were free and 
They were a mainstay of people's entertainment. So mentioning Ostada's name um, would have been an obvious thing uh, for Dickens. Uh, he writes, as my eyes became more accustomed to the gloom, I seemed to stand in a picture by Ostada. I don't think I would today have the courage to write um, such a line and expect people to understand what I'm referring to. All right. Okay. Here we go. Now, Clarkson Stanfield. We have a Clarkson, San Clarkson Stanfield in our gallery. I boast we have the Clarkson Stanfield that made him famous, Mount St. Michael, 1830. William IV loved this painting and commissioned two works uh, after having seen it. He couldn't buy it because it was already sold and the private buyer would not um, give it up, but he bought the second one. Dickens and Stanfield were very good friends and uh, Stanfield painted many works of Dickens for Dickens of his family, of their friends, and also made theatre sets for him. He was referred to warmly by Dickens as Stanny. He was born in English. His father was an Irish author, actor, and former seaman. His mother was sent, said to have been a painter. And he was named after his father's friend, Thomas Clarkson, an English abolitionist and a leading campaigner against the slave trade in the British Empire. He was in 1806 apprenticed to a coach decorator, uh, but because of alcoholism and ridiculous advances by his boss's wife, he left and went to sea. He spent 10 years at sea. Uh, when he returned, he became a decorator and a painter for the theatre. He worked with a scene painter, David Roberts, whom we'll see later, and both of them were friends of Dickens and created dioramas and panoramas as well, and sets for Dickens's plays. In 1834, he abandoned theatrical scene paintings, except for two good friends, the actor William McCready and Charles Dickens. So for a humbug, in 1855, Dickens writes of Stanfield painting a backdrop for one of his plays. With a raging sea and a transparent light, he enters into the project with the greatest delight, and I think we shall make a capital thing of it. Which play was it? On Stansfield's death, he wrote to his son, no one of your father's friends can ever have loved him more dearly than I always did, or can have better known the worth of his noble character. In an obituary uh, written by Dickens in All the Year Round in 1867, he writes, the man famous in all countries for his marvellous rendering of the waves that break upon her shores, of her ships and seamen, of her coasts and skies, of her storms and sunshine, of the many marvels of the deep. Let's take a closer look at this work. Look at the transparency and translucency of the waves. Man is struggling beneath while the church and castle on Mount St. Michael stand in the mist of omnipotent and omnipotent skies are looking down. And we are looking here at a shipwreck. And because of that, I cannot go past um, the storm scene from David Copperfield, chapter 55. The tremendous sea itself, when I could find sufficient pause to look at it in the agitation of the blinding wind, the flying stones and sand, and the awful noise confounded me. As the high watery walls came rolling in and at their highest tumbled into the surf, they looked as if 
the least would engulf the town as the receding wave swept back with a hoarse roar, it seemed to scoop out deep caves in the beach, as if its purpose were to undermine the earth. When some white-headed billows thundered on and dashed themselves to pieces before they reached the land, every fragment of the late hole seemed possessed by the full might of its wrath, rushing to be gathered to the composition of another monster, Undulating hills were changed to valleys. Undulating valleys with a solitary storm bird sometimes skipping through them were lifted up to hills. Masses of water shivered and shook the beach with a booming sound. Every shape tumultuously rolled on as soon as made to change its shape and place and beat another shape and place away. The ideal shore on the horizon with its towers and buildings rose and fell. The clouds flew past and thick, fast and thick. I seemed to see a rending and upheaving of all nature. But the sea, having upon it the additional agitation of the whole night, was infinitely more terrific than when I had seen it last. Every appearance it had then presented bore the expression of being swelled and the height to which the breakers rose and looking over one another, bore one another down and rolled in in interminable hosts was most appalling. In the difficulty of hearing anything but wind and waves and in the crowd and the unspeakable confusion and my first breathless efforts to stand against the weather, I was so confused that I looked out to sea for the wreck and saw nothing but the foaming heads of the great waves. A half-dressed boatman standing next to me pointed with his bare arm, a tattooed arrow on it pointing in the same direction to the left. And then, oh great heaven, I saw it close in upon us. Stanfield and... Dickens, what a great team. By the way, I didn't tell you that Stanfield was going to illustrate Dickens's um, travels in Italy, but because of its anti-Catholic sentiments, desisted. Nonetheless, they remained friends, and that is seriously to to Dickens' credit, as we'll see later, he wasn't so generous with other friends. David Roberts, Stanfield's um, companion and partner in painting, who also painted, as I said, scenes for Dickens' plays. He, we have a, a work by him. Uh, he painted many architectural pieces. And we have this interior of the Church of St. Anne painted in Bruges. Uh, it's a precise architectural work that uh, he did so well and seems so different to Stanfield's raging shipwrecks and seas, but it is not dissimilar to Mount St. Michael in its spirituality. Look at the smallness of the figures, the vastness and height of the church, the light entering in patches through the windows, both works share a sense of awe, spirituality, fatalism. David Roberts met Dickens through Stanfield and painted the backdrop for his play, Not So Bad As We Seem. He gave Dickens a gift of a painting of the Sphinx and he wrote on the back, presented as a mark of respect for his talent and work by his very sincere friend and admirer, David Roberts, Royal Academy, January the 1st, 1850. So there we have, and we can see the light, patches of light coming in here. You can see some people are standing in light, some in shadow, as though, as though to say, who will be blessed and who not. It is a beautiful um, spiritual work. Daniel McLeese, speaking of a friend who was wronged by Dickens. He was an Irish uh, artist. He was six years older than Dickens and he joked to be the younger and Dickens referred to him as Mac. 
They met in 1838 when he was already a successful historical and literary painter and a full member of the Royal Academy. Um, he made illustrations for the Christmas books, The Chime and The Cricket uh, on the Hearth. The villainous Bill Sykes in Oliver Twist is, based, is said to be based on Sir Francis Sykes, who brought an action later abandoned against MacLeese for having adultery with his wife. MacLeese painted several portraits of the Dickens family. He also did sketches and paintings of their trips together. They were very close. But he used Georgina Hogarth, Catherine's uh, Catherine Dickens' sister, as a model for his painting in uh, uh, called The Waterfall at St. Knighton's, which you can see at the Victoria and Albert, if you can ever get there. Um, and Dickens then purchased it anonymously, he said, because he will either give it or set some preposterous price upon it. And their friendship began to, to fray. In 1840, Dickens asked MacLeese to, quote, join me on a great London back slums kind of walk, seeking adventures in night errant style. Dickens liked to walk, take long walks, as you know, late, late at night. MacLeese found the sights and smells of crowded dwellings and of impoverished people more than he could bear and retired feeling ill. Well, Dickens disparaged him for spending too much time at the Royal Academy, calling it his water bottle. Dickens started to describe MacLeese as a discursive and eccentric painter in writing. He said MacLeese's work had become hard, blaming his long sightedness, which, quote, deprived any distant object he looked at of the mystery and charm which often adds so much beauty to a world seen through more short-sighted eyes. MacLeese sent letters begging to know what was wrong and died in, um, on the 25th of April, 1870, six months before Dickens never having his letters answered. When he died, when MacLeese died, Dickens destroyed all the letters that MacLeese had sent to him, claiming that MacLeese, like Dickens himself, would have wished them to remain private. Dickens then gave a speech at the Royal Academy dinner in 1870, praising MacLeese and his art, saying he gallantly sustained the true dignity of his vocation without one grain of self ambition. Well, wouldn't you want to wring Dickens' neck? But what do we have by MacLeese? Not this portrait, which is in the National Gallery of London. We have this medal. Mac created by MacLeese for the Inter International Exhibition London 1862. We see Britannia standing on a raised dais beside a crouching lion surrounded by six women representing industry, agriculture, and the arts. And below there is a below the lion, there is written D. MacLeese Royal Academy, Le Leonard C. Wyon. Now for a humbug, to whom was this medal awarded? This person, founded the University of Melbourne and the Public Library, now the State Library, the Royal Melbourne Hospital and many other institutions. He sentenced Ned Kelly to death. Ned Kelly, he was like our Robin Hood. He acquitted 13 Eureka rebels. He supported the Discharged Prisoners Aid Society. He was also a lifelong defender of Aborigines often taking their cases for no pay. He was born in Ireland. He studied law at Trinity College in Dublin. In 1838, he was admitted to the Irish bar, but with the economic downturn, he 
and he could not find work. His father died and he emigrated to Australia. He arrived in Sydney in 1839, was admitted to the New South Wales Bar, but couldn't get work because he had a shipboard affair with a married woman. Naughty man. Melbourne took him and he was knighted in 1860. He never married, but maintained a long relationship with the mother of his four children, Louisa Barrow. She was of lower social status and education and the relationship relationship earned him much public criticism. At the execution of Ned Kelly, he uttered the customary words, may God have mercy on your soul. And Kelly replied, I will go a little further than that and say, I will see you where I go. Well, he died 12 years, uh, 12 days after Kelly of a carbuncle on the neck. And the Victorians believed in an afterlife. I would hate to think what happened when the two met up there. But we have his medal. Who is he for a humbug? Now, Edwin Landseer. Animal pop uh, painting was a popular subject for the Victorians. Uh, Landseer was known as the greatest artist of the Victorian e era of the greatest painter of animals. Um, his animals had an anthropomorphic look. Um, at the age of 13, two of his oils were already hung at the Royal Academy in London. He was a good looking and lovable character. He was friends with Dickens. Prince Albert and Queen Victoria loved him. The Queen called him the cleverest artist there is. He visited them frequently, painted their dogs, taught them how to sketch. We have engravings of sketches by Queen Victoria in our gallery. In 1850, Queen Victoria knighted him. In 1865, he was elected president of the Royal Academy, but declined due to failing health. In this painting, we see Titania and Bottom. Fairies, fairy paintings based on literary references and fairy tales were very popular in Victorian England. Often artists painted Midsummer Night's Dream and the Tempest. Titania, queen of the fairies, is under a spell. She falls in love with a man who has the head of an ass, as can happen. Um, it is interesting that the rabbits are large, the fairies ride them like horses. The woman here is equated with animal sensuality and stupidity. Well, we know that story. Uh, the work has a wonderful, delicate, fairyland quality about it. So for a humbug, for a humbug, in 1839, Lancey's father told him off for reading an extract from a Dickens novel out loud to his life drawing class at the Royal Academy. Which novel was it? <coughs> Excuse me. Which novel? Uh, there is a story told uh, about uh, Landseer and Dickens is that one evening Landseer invited Dickens to dinner to his home. And while they were dining, there was a knock on the door and the carcass, the zoo had delivered a carcass of a lion which significantly put Dickens off his meal after that. But um, they were good friends. And one day as Landseer was walking, um, somebody asked Landseer, well, how's your friend Dickens? And he said, oh, he's raven mad, raven mad. Well, raven man meant that uh, uh, Dickens um, was obsessed with his pet raven. But people thought that Dickens had gone mad and the rumours circulated quite seriously. Dickens was very annoyed with Landseer. However, he made it up for him by minding his raven when Dickens went on holidays. He painted the um, Peary Bingle's dog for him and even, uh, I mean, etched it, sorry. And even though the... Um, 
etching was criticised for being stiff. Dickens, Dickens says it doesn't matter. Just having Lancia's name on the publication uh, is worth everything. In later years, he became quite reclusive and lacking in confidence. He was invited one night for dinner. His eyesight had been failing him seriously. Uh, dinner to Dickens' home, and he didn't have the courage to knock on the door and go in. That's Sir Edwin Landseer. All right. The Monopolist. Monopolist. Robert Buss. Robert Buss learned engraving and enamelling from his father, and he was um, a a, a devoted fan of Charles Dickens, although they had never met. In 1836, Dickens was in a spot. Robert Seymour, who was illustrating Pickwick papers, committed suicide, and they needed someone quickly to illustrate the third instalment. Charles Dickens was Buss's hero. He'd already provided an illustration for Dick Dickens' sketch, a little talk about spring and sweeps, as a wood block and there was no problem. And he stopped his own work of a major canvas for the Royal Academy to quickly draw a range of Pickwickian characters and situations in a manner sympathetic with Seymour. Chaplin, Chapman and Hall chose the Muggleton cricket, cricket match and Miss Wardle and Tupman being spied upon in the arbor. Both scenes featured Dickens's inimitable fat boy. Because Buss was unfamiliar with engraving on steel, he gave his drawings to professional engravers who lost the delicacy and spontaneity of his direct touch. Dickens was disgusted with the result. Buss was dismissed from the fourth instalment of Pickwick Papers and the job was given to George Hablett Brown, known as Fizz. It ate at Buss all his life that within a month he had lost such a chance of illustrating for his hero. Buss spoke with wry humour of his loss. I am, after all, sometimes amused to think how in time to come futile bibliomaniacs will rave over a scarce copy of Pickwick, having in it my two unfortunate etchings. Buss, in fact, painted many works inspired by Dickens' characters all his life. He never met Dickens in person, but continued to admire him. After Dickens' death in 1870, Bass paid a final tribute to the writer. He painted all of Dickens' characters into one work. For a humbug, what work is it? And where is it? For a humbug. Now, Bass had, had many other talents. He was art master in his daughter's school. Um, a student wrote of him many years later, art was in his soul. In science, he was equally at home and his delightful lectures in botany, zoology, geology and astronomy, each illustrated with profuse diagrams were equal to those of any professor of the present day. His chemistry series was marvelous, especially for the smells and explosions while the little plays he arranged for us with costumes made us his devoted students. In 1853, he gave a lecture series on the history of character, uh, caricature and satire in English art um, on tour with his own cartoons. Uh, so what are we looking at here in this painting? The character of the Monopolis possibly uh, was influenced by Samuel Pickwick, he's fat, with spectacles. Uh, Buss says he is the sort of man who would buy up all the coal and necessities and sell them for exorbitant prices. His legs are akimbo. He reads the Times in front of a Victorian fireplace in a Victorian dining room, oblivious to the plight of a cold and wet workman who tries to reach closer to the fire for warmth. Meticulous attention to detail is paid in depicting the cosy setting and furnishings, the white tablecloth, the wine bottle, wine glasses on the mantel above the fireplace, carafe of red wine, 
a glass of wine ready to drink on the table, newspapers on the table, and cheerful advertisements for fine hot joints, one till five o'clock every day, and Ram's Bottom Fine Windsor Ale. I would have loved to have gone there. I wonder if Dickens had seen this work, because there is a great passage in Great Expectations that may well have been inspired by it. The extract is from chapter 43, where Pip is on his way to visit Miss Havisham and Estella at Satis House. He stops at the Blue Boar for breakfast and sees Bentley Drummle. Knows Bentley Drummle is also there to see Estella and it drives him mad. They pretend not to notice each other, but while Pip is eating his, eating his breakfast, Bentley Drummle is hogging the fire and that Pip will not abide. I sat at my table while he stood by the fire. By degrees, it became an enormous injury to me that he stood by the fire and I got up determined to have my share of it. I had to put my hand behind his legs for the poker while I went up to the fireplace to stir the fire, but still pretended not to know him. Is this a cut? said Mr. Drummle. Oh, said I, poker in hand. It's you, is it? How do you do? I wonder, I was wondering who it was who kept the fire off. With that, I poked tremendously and having done so, planted myself side by side with Mr. Drummle, my shoulders squared and my back to the fire. You've just come down, said Drummle, edging me a little away with his shoulder. Yes, said I, edging him a little away with my shoulder. Beastly place, said Drummle. You're part of the country, I think. Yes, I assented. I'm told it's very like your Shropshire. Not in the least like it, said Drummle. Here Mr. Drummle looked at his boots and I looked at mine and then Mr. Drummle looked at my boots and I looked at his. Have you been here long, I asked, determined not to yield an inch of the fire. Long enough to be tired of it, returned Drummle, pretending to yawn. Do you stay here long? Can't say, answered Mr. Drummle. Do you? Can't say, said I. He whistled a little. So did I. Large tract of marshes about here, I believe, said Drummle. Yes, what of that, said I. Drummle looked at me, then at my boots, and then said, ah, and laughed. Are you amused, Drummle? No, said he, not particularly. I'm going out for a ride in the saddle. I mean to explore these marshes for amusement. Out of the way villages there, they tell me, curious little public houses, smithies and that. Waiter? Yes, sir. Is that horse of mine ready? Brought round to the door, sir. I say, look you, sir. The lady won't ride today. The weather won't do. Very good, sir. And I don't dine because I'm going to dine at the ladies. Very good, sir. Then Drummel glanced at me with an insolent triumph on his great jowl face that cut me to the heart. One thing was manifest to both of us, and that was that until relief came, neither of us would relinquish the fire. So we are. Bus and Dickens. Who have we got next? Ah, that's uh, okay. Yes, so uh, in which work now in the Dickens Museum? So you've only got one question to answer. Did Bus include all of Dickens' characters? A humbug. Ah, John Everett Millet. Where are we? John Millet. Here we are. John Everett Millet. Well, huh. <laughs> they were friends. Dickens and Millet were friends. He were, Millet was a member of the Pre-Raphaelite brother, Brotherhood. Um, and uh, they harked back to 14th century detail and colour and naturalist. Uh, he mixed in Dickens' so circle, but when in 1850 he painted Christ in the house of his parents and exhibited it at the Royal Academy and pictured Christ as a skinny runt in his father's carpenter shop, Dickens let loose in writing. Dickens' review in Household Words 
1850 June, a kneeling woman, so horrible in her ugliness that supposing it were possible for any human cre creature to exist for a moment with this, that dislocated throat, she would stand out from the rest of the company as a monster in the vilest cabaret in France or the lowest gin shop in England. John Ruskin defended the work. Ruskin's wife, Effie, modeled for Millet, fell in love with him, left Ruskin, they had an annulment, married Millet, they had five children. And as Millet grew in fame, Dickens friend urged him to make up with Millet. So Dickens sent him information on the newly formed fire brigade from his journal, Household Words. The fire, the fire brigade uh, went from being private to public, from saving property to saving life. The letter he sent Millet, a very ungracious letter, I don't regret what I said, but Millet was gracious. He remained a friend and was called on to draw Dickens' head on his deathbed. Now, this, this painting, The Rescue, caused quite a stir and drew a lot of criticism. Um, Millet actually witnessed the death of a fireman in the course of a rescue, and he wanted to show their bravery. And he displayed this work in 1855 at the Royal Academy. A fireman rescues three children. Their mother receives them into her arms. The work is acclaimed for its startling transitions of color, its dramatic effect, the sleeve of the mother's nightgown changes from slate blue to pale pink, but there is a virile working class man who rescues middle class children. Where is their father? The mother seems to welcome the man, not the children. So poor, poor, poor Millet. Uh, he sought to create the correct effects of light and smoke by using a sheet of colored glass and by burning planks of wood. He went to enormous lengths to get those effects. He was one of the few friends to attend Kate Perugini's wedding that's Dickens' daughter. He was knighted in 1896, elected head of the Academy, but died later in the same year from throat cancer, and he is buried in St. Paul's Cathedral. Now, Frank Hall. Frank Hall was a social, social realist, like von Herkimer. Remember the work we saw in the beginning of the migrant workers on the road? social realism, gritty work. Uh, Hull illustrated social issues for the graphic um, and was admired by Queen Victoria and Van Gogh, who had several of his illustrations from the graphic. We own five works by Hull, two um, permanently on display. Once what Oscar Wilde had, had quipped that one must have a heart of stone to read the death of little Nell without laughing. Life became very hard for artists who specialized in pictures of death and destitution. Therefore, in 1880, Hull abandoned painting what had come to be seen as his morbid, sentimental pictures. Um, and, uh, and started becoming a successful portrait painter. He died at the age of only 18, uh, 43 in 1888. Uh, the cult of death in Queen Victoria's time, she never got over Albert's death and funerals came to cost of fortunes. The rituals surrounding mourning, for example, in Great Expectations, we have references to it in Mrs. Gargery's funeral and also Camilla complaining that Matthew did not want to buy black trimmings for a family member's funeral. She cried about it, quote, from breakfast till dinner and it injured her digestion. Here we see a darkened room, scant light coming in physically and emotionally for a young widow, a small barefoot girl, hair unkempt, looking on helpless at her bereft and helpless mother. Signs of poverty washing hanging above the hearth, no mourning paraphernalia. 
just grief and poverty, not enough money to deck themselves out in black ribbons. Next one. Thomas Fade. Thomas Fade. The Mitherless Band. He was not a social realist. He painted from literature, often inspired by Dickens' poverty, charity, sickness, social isolation were his themes. As a Scottish painter, he is said to have done for Scottish art what Robert Burns did for Scottish song. Fade and Dickens knew each other quite well. In 1862, Dickens paid Fade 20 guineas to paint Kate Nickleby. Fade also signed a letter Dickens, uh, uh, written by Dickens decrying the noise of London Street and requesting that legislation be passed to stop it. Street musicians and street vendors, it was a cacophony and Dickens couldn't work. The Mitherless Ban is based on a poem of the same name by the Scottish weaver and poet, William Thom. You see, a ragged orphan is welcomed into the bosom of a poor Scottish family whose humble cottage is already full to overflowing with hungry mouths to feed. Now the poem, how the poem came to be written, um, Tom, uh, a correspondent for the Inverary uh, paper at the time said, Thom gave me the following narrative as to the origin of the Mitherless Ban. I quote his own words. When I was living in Aberdeen, I was limping round the house to my garret when I heard the greeting of a ween. A lassie was thumping a ban when out came a big dame bellowing, ye hussy, will ye lick a motherless ban? I hobbled up the stair and wrote the song before sleeping. So I'll read you some of the poem. When other bairnies are hushed to their home by auntie or cousin or fricky granddame, why stands last and lonely and nobody caring? Tis the pure dotty loony, the motherless bairn. And neath his cold brow, sickened dreams hover there, or oh, hands that won't kindly comb his dark hair. But morning brings clutches, a reckless and stern, that love not the locks of the motherless band. And, uh, her, oh, speak him now harshly, he trembles the while, he bends to your bidding and blesses your smile. In their dark hour of anguish, the heartless shall learn that God's deals the blow for the motherless band. So it's a very, very strong poem and it's worthwhile hearing. Thomas Fade. Ah, Paul Falcon a pool. Now, for a humbug, what figure did Goldsmith write about in his novel of the same name, published in 1766? The Emigrant's Departure, feat Emigration, features in a few of Dickens' novels. How to avoid poverty, how to get rid of difficult characters, in his novel, uh, both questions, in his novel of David Copperfield, sorry, both questions are answered. Send them to Australia. Mr. Micawber, who was forever living off borrowed money with the help of friends, took his family and emigrated to Australia. Mr. Mel, the school teacher who was sacked from David's school because his mother lived in the poorhouse, found a home in Australia. Um, and we have quoted here from the village. Oh dear, don't tell me this page has gone a missing. Ah, ah, okay, I beg your pardon. I'll just have to tell you about it. So here we see portrayed A 
a family saying goodbye to the older father. They are being paid to leave. You can see that some children here are wearing shoes and some not. Those who are not are staying. Those who are wearing shoes are leaving. The old man is going to be left alone. Um, composition wise, it is a very daring portrait. Um, the the travellers are wearing new clothes for travel. Um, the young woman holding on to a maid's hand, uh, they can barely look at each other, uh, is wearing a, a brand new bright red cape for the journey. Um, and there is a lot of sadness here. You can see the old father is very frail. Now, the caption reads, what sorrows gloom that parting day to take them from their native land away is a quote from the deserted village by Oliver Goldsmith. Um, and, uh, and it was well known, a well known quote and a very popular work of Goldsmith that we refer to in the 18th and still in the 19th century. So it was well known. He criticizes rural depopulation, moral corruption found in towns, consumerism, um, la, um, avarice, and the pursuit of wealth from international trade. Uh, the poem that uh, he refers to del is deliberately, precisely obscure and does not reveal the reason why, why the village has been deserted. His immigrant's departure is also a double entendre that would not have been lost on the English public. Uh, and the caption would have been associated with his work, the vicar of question mark. The person hero in question was an author, a colonial promoter and was imprisoned in Newgate for running off and marrying a 15 year old heiress. He didn't need the money, he was already rich from another heiress. But his imprisonment in Newgate was to transform his whole career. In prison, he occupied himself by inquiring why the prisoners were there, how effective were their punishments and what were their prospects. His imprisonment led to his critical study of emigration and to his remedy systematic colonization. He commenced a public movement to establish free civilized colonies in Australia. This was associated with growing public disquiet about the transportation of convicts, which was likened to slave trade that had only been abolished in 1833. For a brief period, two emigration systems, the government and the bounty schemes, operated concurrently. The government scheme, which ran from 1837 to 1840, under which the Maitland was used, um, uh, was utilized, the, the, the boat, uh, was the larger of the two and was directed and financed by the British government. The bounty scheme from 1835 to 41 was organized by the colonial government of New South Wales on behalf of the settlers who were dissatisfied with British government programs. Prospective settlers were offered bounties as an incentive to emigrate. Both schemes, in fact, provided significant financial assistance to emigrate as the cost of passage was prohibitive for the majority of intending settlers. The assistance provided was similar under each scheme. Uh, in 1838, the amount offered was 36 pounds for a man and wife under 40 years of age, 18 pounds when the husband was over 40, 18 pounds for each unmarried female 15 to 30 years of age, 10 pounds for each child, 17 to 14, five pounds for each child, one to seven. The late 1830s was the first of large scale free emigration to New South Wales. In 1838, over 6,100 assisted emigrants made the journey. Despite the large, okay. 
Okay. And there was the potato famine and, and, and so much, some wars that were, were taking men, people chose to leave. So this is a very emotive, um, heartbreaking farewell here because they know they will never, ever see one another again and the man is going to be left, the father completely alone. Now, on a lighter note, John Linnell, we have this painting called Wheat, for, for which John Linnell was enormous, enormously famous in 1860, though uh, I cannot see the, 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 the genius in it. But um, he uh, commissioned, he was the one who commissioned 36 watercolours from William Blake, which we now hold in the National Gallery of, Gallery of Victoria. Um, and he made his money from portraits, but he said, I paint portraits to live. I live to paint landscape. And he loved to paint harvest images of a poetic rustic vision, gentle, benevolent, honest, rural labor. This painting wheat being gathered in quickly before the storm is one of the most expensive paintings bought by the National Gallery of Victoria. In 1850, he purchased a property at Red Hill, Surrey, where he lived till his death. Now, his connection with Dickens, it's a slim one, but it's there. In 1852, Charles Dickens visited the philanthropic school for ragamuffin boys at Red Hill, which he wrote up in Household Words. And to get there, Dickens walked across Linnell's field on his way to the school. Also, Samuel Palmer, the artist, was John Linnell's son-in-law. And when Clarkson Stanfield reneged on illustrating travels in Italy, Palmer stepped into the fray and Dickens was pleased with his work. So we have a slight connection with that Linnell painting, nonetheless a connection. Marshall Claxton, another image of emigration, uh, and he, Marshall Claxton himself, emigrated to Sydney to try and sell his paintings in 1850. He mounted his first art exhibition um, in Australia. Uh, he, ha he had great interest in his work, but he sold little. He painted a commission from Baroness Burdett Coots, Suffer Little Children to Come Unto Me, and according to Dickens in Household Words, it was the first important picture painted in Australia. Coots had inherited 1.8 million pounds. She and Dickens were good friends and established Urania House together, a facility to house fallen women. Um, uh, and Dickens said of these women, well, they like to wear color, let them wear color. There was an excess of men in the colonies and to write it, the British government offered incentives for women to emigrate, but the British public were given the impression of the single female emigrant as being low class drunks and prostitutes. So here, Claxton is writing the image in a very demure picture of a young lady at sea between two worlds, although she does wear a red, scarf. So he, do, he does leave us in a little bit of doubt. What will her position be when she finally gets to the other shore? We do not know. Now, we're coming to the end. If you haven't yet had a taste of Dickens' visual style, in this image he left us a recipe for a painting and I used Photoshop to follow his recipe. It was so easy. His recipe for this painting appears in Great Expectations, Chapter 1. The marshes were just a long black horizontal line then as I stopped to look after him. And the river was just another horizontal line, not nearly so broad nor yet so black. And the sky was just a, a row of long, angry red lines and dense black lines intermixed. On the edge of the river, I could faintly make out the only two black things in all the prospect that seemed to be standing upright. One of these was the beacon by which the sailor steered, like an unhooped cask upon a pole, 
an ugly thing when you were near it, the other a gibbet with some chains hanging to it, which once held a pirate. So thank you, my friends. Uh, that's, that's the talk. And now for the um, humbug, I've got, hope you've got your answers ready. Humbug, please. Here are your answers. Okay. I'm going to get my answers. Okay. What date in May 1819 was Queen Victoria born? 24. What date in May 1861 was the National Gallery of Victoria officially open? Oh, sorry, 24. Hope I said 24. Both of them 24. And what date in May 1875 was the National Gallery of Victoria's first purpose-built picture galleries, as opposed to sculpture, open? 24. So it is no coincidence that we hold so much Victorian art. We had the money to buy it and we made sure we honoured uh, Queen Victoria in so many ways. Next question. Oh, why isn't it? Okay, got it. Where does, where does Dickens write that it is really high time Mr. Etty was prosecuted and made public example of? Huh? Anybody? No? Yeah? Oh, you, you're on, you're on. Okay, okay. Sorry. Oh, you may as well unmute now. Yeah. Would it be household words? Uh, no. In sketches of young gentlemen and young couples. I'll read you the full passage. Hmm. He satirizes prudes in The Formal Couple, published in 1840. They go sometimes to the exhibition of the Royal Academy, but that is often more shocking than the stage itself. And the formal lady thinks it really is high time Mr. Etty was prosecuted and made public example of. Well, there you go. He made a fortune. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, for a humbug on Ostada, where in Dickens' work does Dickens mention the Dutch artist Ostada? As my eyes became more accustomed to the gloom, I seemed to stand in a picture by Ostada. Does anyone know? In David Copperfield, on entering the Macorba's cabin on a boat bound for Australia, oh. that is how he pictured the scene. Now, you can just imagine what it was like in England at the time. But Dickens was fully confident he could just say, I'm standing in a painting by Ostada, and people would instantly picture the gloom and the crowded conditions. Stanfield, for a humbug. In 1855, Dickens writes, Dickens writes of Stanfield painting a backdrop for his play. Uh, he writes, with a raging sea and a transparent light, he instant enters into the project with the greatest delight, and I think we shall make a capital thing of it. Which play was it? Rosenby. Rosenby. No. The Lighthouse. The Lighthouse. In 1855, put on at Tavistock House, London. The Lighthouse. The Lighthouse. Okay, now the medal. Who? Who? It was awarded to Chief Judge Sir Edmund Barry. He founded the University of Melbourne, the Public Library, the Royal Melbourne Hospital, many other, many other major institutions. He sentenced Ned Kelly to death. He was a, he acquitted 13 Eureka rebels. He supported um, the Discharged Prisoners Aid Society. He was a lifelong defender of Aborigines and uh, he was a, a remarkable individual. He made Melbourne, he made cultural Melbourne. And we have his medal made by Daniel McLean. Now, Sir Edwin Landseer in 1839, Landseer's father told him off for reading an extract from a Dickens novel out loud to his life drawing class 
at the Royal Academy. Which novel was it? 1839. Nicholas? No, it was Oliver, uh, Oliver Twist. Twist. Oliver oh. Twist, that's what I thought. Very good, Oliver Twist. Now, and uh, for a humbug in which work now in the Dickens Museum did Robert Buss, oh, yeah. oh. all of Dickens' characters. You know, Dickens dream. dream. Good on you. Yeah. And our last one, Emigration, 1766. Oliver Goss, a novel about a vicar. What was his name? Wakefield. Wakefield, the vicar of Wakefield, and the man who um, orchestrated the emigration scheme was Edwin uh, Wakefield. Edwin, he's got a middle name, sorry. Edward, Edward Gibbon Wakefield. Yeah. Okay, and there we have it, my friends. Thank you for your, for your time and... <laughs> I, I don't Thank you. Thank you. I hope it didn't take too long. I didn't have a clock. So thank you for having me. We thank were you. lucky to have you back. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it, it was quite an era where where artists and um and and writers were so intimately connected. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Nowadays, not so. It's more each man for himself. But you had the development of the education system at the time. There were so many children surviving that uh, London was overrun with young people. And a lot of the older people were concerned that the young people would turn to crime. So that was when they developed church schools and things. And then you have the development of, of education, which happens in England parallel, obviously. And it was amazing how it was considered important to add all of that educational stuff, the, the wonderful arts and things like that, and not just to move in and provide homes for people settling. I'm not talking about how well anything was done, but mm -hmm. just the, uh -huh. the Victorian perspective, if you'll excuse me. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. That was great, Nita. Thank you so oh, much. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. It was wonderful, yeah. Anita. Thank you. Well, we Thank wonderful. You. We need you back Bye. again. Thank you, Thank, you. Thank you so much. Okay. My pleasure. Tim, you be well, everybody be well, and uh, thank you very, very much for being here and for your support. I do appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Such a oh. joy to have you back. Thank you. Oh, oh, there's somebody who's got a friend who's working on Clarks and Stanfield. Oh, Thomas, oh, how interesting. Yes, um, she's working on the print culture, the books that Clarkson published which were, I think, uh, a number of them. And so I think she'll be very interested to hear about this uh, connection. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, wonderful. I'm very pleased. Okay, let me know how it goes. I'd be interested to hear about the research. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I hope 2022 uh, brings an easier year for yeah. everybody. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> Face, more face-to-face -face meetings and um, who knows let's hope <laughs> thank you thank you it was thank wonderful you. thank you so so much thank you my pleasure i'm glad thank you thank you, you anita thank, thank you have a nice evening everybody and thank you have a nice day anita thanks jim <clears throat> thank, bye -bye. You. thank you thank you right. goodbye goodbye bye, -bye. bye, -bye.